Well, as American Christians in the 21st century, you are probably familiar with the term born-again Christian. Now, if we were to ask Christians throughout history, if they were familiar with the identifier, I'm a born-again Christian, uh, that probably wouldn't be so. It wasn't until the mid-20th century that some notable figures in Christian, uh, the Christian West began using that language and assigning it as a particular kind of identity, particularly uh, men like Billy Graham, who used that language quite specifically, uh, Chuck Colson, who wrote a book called Born Again, uh, and then even later than that, in the early 70s, uh, the first American president who ever identified as that would be Jimmy Carter, who called himself a born-again Christian. And so the language then became part of a household use. People began to think about that in a way maybe they hadn't before. It became an identifier for Christians. And over the course of the next few decades, it has become a reference point for a pretty wide spectrum of people in our day. Those who would identify as evangelical. In fact, it's kind of become synonymous with Protestant in in the American uh, in Amer- the American culture. But the idea, while the wording and the language of its identification might be kind of new, the, the wording, the idea itself, of course, finds its roots in the teaching of Jesus. It goes all the way back to the first century. We started reading through the passage that Jesus called out this exact language in John 3 just last week in his very famous conversation with a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus. And as he begins to talk about what it takes to get into or to see the kingdom of God, he says, you must be born again. The language, of course, is firmly rooted in the Bible. This passage is an absolute treasure trove of truth. It actually makes me tremble a bit to preach on John 3. Much of the scripture, I have this sense, but John 3, I've been especially hesitating and wondering, should I just, should I just take one verse and just one verse a week for the next 20 weeks? Um, sometimes I thought, well, that, that might kind of get so into the weeds on doctrinal battles and theological arguments and history over that term and this term. It's made me think, well, maybe I zoom out, do eight or ten verses at a time, but then I'm afraid that if, if I do that, then maybe we might miss some of these little nuggets, these little diamonds that are, that are right there before us. And so genuinely, I've been just praying, Lord, I, 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 uh, I'm going to do my best here. I'm trying to just prepare what I think I see in the text. I'm going to seek to explain what I see there to my brothers and sisters, and um, I've been especially um, asking the Lord and His help for knowing how much of each of these texts I should preach on. Today we're going to be uncovering a bit more about what Jesus says about being born again. Saw that language in our text last week, but we spent most of our time on the kingdom of God part of what Jesus said to Nicodemus. You must be born again to see the kingdom of God. I spent most of our time on the kingdom of God. I told you we'd start on born again today. Now, in order for a person to be born again, that's, that's, that language is the language of regeneration. If a person is a Christian, they're born again. If they have saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they're born again. If they're justified, they're born again. And so if I were to look out right now and just discern, I think I'm talking to a bunch of Christians. I, if I were to have a, a deacon run up right now with a little piece of paper and hand it to me, I'd go, okay, oh wow, 100% of the audience is, uh, are, are, are members in good standing at the Mission Church. I was about to preach on being born again, but y'all are born again, so would I jump past that passage? And of course the answer is no. No, we wouldn't. There are some things that you need to be reminded of, some truths about the gospel you need to be reminded of regularly as believers. In fact, I think that your sanctification, how you view it and how you go after, attack it every day of your life, will be highly dependent upon how it is that you see your conversion in the first place. And so, for a handful of reasons, I'm eager to preach through this. My goal is to explain as much as I can in our text today um, then seek to apply it. I'm going to be reading through, uh, backing up, going to the beginning of chapter, one, chapter 3 again, and then reading through verse 8. This is one paragraph. I'm going to read through that. Uh, I'll, I'll cover that text today. I, I expect that next week I'll be doing the same, backing up a bit and recovering a few pieces we kind of quickly ran over. 
But if you have your Bibles, it'd be helpful for you to follow along in John 3, verses 1 through 8. And we're going to be spending our time today mostly in verses 3 through 8 today. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, this ask that I'm offering to you right now is exactly one of the main points, I think, of this text. Father, I'm asking for you to send your spirit uh, to do the work of softening hearts, opening minds, eyes to see what's written here. Um, Lord, I, I, I am keenly aware that if somehow today I were to speak with the greatest knowledge and intellect that could be afforded to a, a man, and if I were to Uh, present my explanation and perhaps my arguments in an airtight way, fully thorough and complete, and to level charges and and, uh, encouragements and perhaps admonition where it's needed. Lord, if I were to do that with all the wisdom of man, but your spirit weren't to be at work, it would be utterly non-impactful. So, Father, I am, I am praying this morning in full reliance on you to do a work with your word here as you do it in my heart as I study and now read and uh, preach. And, Father, in the hearts and the minds of my brothers and sisters as they're seeing these things and hearing them uh, today, please send your spirit to do a work. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus has been uh, speaking with Nicodemus. We've only covered a couple of the things that has been, have been said. The last thing that Jesus said to Nicodemus was this in verse 3. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He just drops that. And now Nicodemus is going to respond. That's Nicodemus' turn. He turns to Jesus, and this is what happens next. In verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So here, obviously, we got Nicodemus confused. He's he's, he's inquiring what Jesus means. And he doesn't say, what do you mean? He challenges the idea of a second physical birth. That's what he does. He at least understands something then, right? He understands the significance of physical birth. What's going on there? He doesn't go, birth? What's that? He, He gets the birth part. That's not a problem. But the only birth that Nicodemus knows of is the natural birth, the fleshly birth, the physical birth. Babies come out of mommies. That's what he gets. He knows that. And so when Jesus says you must be born again, he's got birth in mind. That makes sense to him. But the part that's confusing, of course, is the again part. You know that. But it's helpful to hone in. Where where is the point of confusion? What do you mean by doing that again, Jesus? Now, this is not the first time that Jews were confused by something that Jesus said because they take it too literally. Perhaps better to say, because they'd taken it too woodenly. In fact, if we go back to chapter 2, just one paragraph earlier, Jesus is on the temple grounds, and what does He say? He says, tear down this temple, and I will rebuild it in three days. And what do the Jews go? What do the Jews say about that? They, they, they take him totally woodenly. They take him literally. They go, hold on. Hold on. I'll read it for you in verse 20. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? You see? Same thing. Same problem. Will Jesus literally raise the temple? Yes, but, but the temple of his body. He wasn't 
wasn't lying to him. He will raise the temple in three days. But his disciples would later realize he was using symbolic, a spiritual language. He would raise his body. Here, the same kind of thing is being stated. And the same type of confusion is taking place. Oh, man, this guy just takes Jesus. He's taking his words too woodenly. Oh, can a man crawl back into his mother's womb? In fact, many scholars and commentators in history have looked at this line, and it sounds like it's scoffing, because it would would be odd for him to have no category in his mind for metaphor, allegory, for some sense of spiritualism or symbolism in language. So for him to say it like this isn't a genuine question. Huh, how can I do that? But he's actually challenging Jesus. Can that really happen? Judge for yourself. It's hard to know Nicodemus' heart here. One thing for sure, Jesus knows what's in Nicodemus, and this is what happens next. Now, I want, I want to, before I jump to this next verse, I just want to ask this a question of, of my brothers and sisters here. If you're a believer, you're born again, and let's just say that you have a non-believing friend or family member who asks you this same question, essentially. They say, what does it mean to be born again? I've heard that language. Someone calling someone a born-again believer? I, I suspect you probably call yourself a born-again believer. Yes? Okay. What does that mean? Can't mean, you know, crawling back into a womb. What does it mean to be born again? If someone were to ask you that question, how exactly would you answer it? I found myself asking this question of myself because what I would start saying is very different than what Jesus says next. In other words, I think that Jesus sees that there's something that needs to be dredged up and dealt with in Nicodemus that he goes to, that may or may not be true necessarily of a friend across the table at a coffee shop with you. Have that in mind, if you would, how you would explain being born again. And now let's look at what Jesus says. First, he restates, he makes the claim again, slight word change, and then in three verses he's going to answer. So follow me with with this. This is the rest of the sermon talking about this. Starting in verse 5, Jesus answered. And his answer starts with claiming it again. He's saying the same thing. He's not switching gears. This is the same thing. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now you... You might see the similarity, the parallel there between verse 3 and verse 5. He, he stated the same thing twice, just with slight variation. So we saw, uh, he again uses emphasis. I tell you the truth, truly, truly. He's, it's kind of a doubling down. Listen up. Take note. This is an important one. Pen ready kind of moment, right? But he says, born of water and the Spirit. And he says, enter the kingdom of God instead of just see the kingdom of God. And so... There's some way in which born of water and spirit equates with born again. He doesn't say again here in this verse. He says born of water and spirit. There's something equated there. Additionally, see the kingdom of God can be equated with enter the kingdom of God. I I spoke to that briefly last week. But you should know that right here in this verse, John 3, 5, There is a bit of a debate amongst Christians as to what Jesus means by water and spirit. Water and the spirit, depending on your your translation. There's a debate exactly what's meant. There's a bunch of different views. And and truth be told, I actually will unpack this a bit in, in future weeks, probably next week, when Jesus confronts and rebukes Nicodemus for being a teacher in Israel. You don't know these things. We're probably gonna do it there. Um But for now, I don't want you to get sidetracked by that. I don't want you to be distracted by that right now. I just want you to notice this. It's very clear that the emphasis is put on the Spirit, not on the water. He never mentions water again the rest of this chapter. Instead, he explains the movement and the activity of the Spirit. That's what he does. So we're going to hone in right there, too. That's where we're going to spend our energies today. I'll unpack the water and Spirit stuff, uh, Lord willing, in the future, okay? So here he is, restating what he said in verse 3. Nicodemus was confused. He says it again, and now he's going to unpack it for him over the next three verses. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Pause there for a second. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Now, that part of what he just said, I I suspect 
is what Nicodemus already knows. That's the part he gets right. He gets birth right. He knows what birth is. Physical birth, literal birth. And I think Jesus is affirming that. You know, flesh, flesh gives birth to flesh. It's not a challenging concept. That's the one thing that we start with, an understanding right there. Natural birth only produces natural life. That's what you get. Well, that's not enough. Because if a person is not born of the Spirit, then he or she remains spiritually dead in their sins. See, flesh produces flesh, but spirit produces spirit. If spirit has not done its production, then it will not result in a person being alive in the spirit. Paul says this in Ephesians 2. This would be one of the first places that kind of the way that I think through an explanation of the gospel using the word of God, I'd go to Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. That's the first place I'd go when I'm thinking of trying to explain What does it mean to be born again? I I think that's one of the places I'd go. I'd first want to explain, you're dead. That's the part you got to get. You come into this world physically alive, spiritually dead. That's that's one of the big illustrations in the New Testament of a spiritual state of a person. Dead. That's what you come in. You come in as a spiritual corpse, although physically alive. He says this in, in Ephesians 2. I'll read what Paul says. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, and the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Here Paul in Ephesians 2 is saying universally, like the rest of mankind, are naturally, by the flesh, born into spiritually dead states. That's how we come into the world, spiritually dead, and we must be made spiritually alive. Under the wrath of God as a result of our sin nature. You need to know, believers, you need to hear this all the time. You need to be reminded by this all the time. And if you're not a believer, you need to take note even in a different way. You need a new birth. You need to be made into a new creation. Not just a few tweaks on your life. Not just a few external changes to kind of adjust because you're a little rough around the edges. God wants to start with this beautiful uh, kind of blossom and there's got some crustiness that's kind of developed over hard experiences in life and he's going to deal with those so we go back to the root of who you are. No, that's not the way the Bible talks about our sinful nature. The Bible refers to it as death, a a state of spiritual deadness. Uh, You might even say not yet aliveness, (laughs) okay? Needing to be brought into life. You need a complete and deep heart change. And the reason we need to double down on this, especially in our day, is because the world will tell you to stay as you are. In fact, the world in our day, more freshly than maybe in any other age, are saying the most ridiculous kinds of things about the nature of you is only who you subjectively determine you to be on a changing day-to-day, minute-to-minute basis. Whatever you think you are, whoever you think you are, whatever you think about you, that's reality. That's what the world says. And so if you think that you're mostly good, of course you are. No one can tell you otherwise. You think you're a man, even if you're born a woman, of course you are, no matter what anyone else has says. And you and I know in our gut something is off here. We need a complete and deep heart change. If you stay the way that you are, prior to conversion, you will stay spiritually dead. There's a lot of talk about like don't, don't let someone try to change you. Let someone don't let try to some, don't let somebody try to make you something you're not. Unless you're a dead person and need to be made a live person, spiritually speaking. External tweaks, of course, are not enough. A lot of people have done this. They've they've embraced some form of religion over the course of their lives, where they say, "Okay, here's the deal. Um, I, I can acknowledge intellectually." That if groups of people gather together and all do these same kinds of things that aren't preferable to me, it'll go poorly over time. And so there has to be some mitigating factor to our own preferences, uh, something outside of me. So let's try to conform to some system of law, some system of governance, 
even some religious system. We'll, get, we'll acknowledge that there's some higher power in some sense that should govern what we do, so we shouldn't kill somebody because, not just because of preference, but, but maybe because there's something a little more than that. Let's just abide by certain structures and rules. And a significant number of the people that you and I have dealt with in our lives probably land in that boat where they know and will we'll give, give a lip service to. They'll pay some level of deference to the idea that there have to be some external restraints on us that we can accommodate. But if that's what a person's heart life becomes all about, it's external tweaks. And in, the, in Jesus' day, there were whole groups of people who had become masters of refining the things on the outside. The Pharisees. Have you ever thought that you can become a Christian by good works? That's just dead false. You cannot bring yourself to life by works. I think the whole of the gospel is that undeserving people, because of our sin, rightly deserving God's wrath and judgment. We just said, by nature, children of wrath, all my, like all mankind. But God in His infinite goodness and kindness and His gracious mercy gives us His perfect Son, Jesus Christ. Not just provide a, hey, look at Him so you can do like He does, but more and better than that. He satisfies the perfect life that you and I ought to have lived. And not only that, but He even takes the punishment due for those of us who have sinned, all mankind who have sinned, and goes to the cross bearing the weight of the punishment for the sins of all who will ever believe. That if you repent of your sins, turn in saving faith to Jesus, you stop trying to honor, worship anything else as a Savior and go only to Him, in Him alone, you too can have eternal life. That all the judgment and wrath deserving for your sins will have been laid upon His shoulders and you can be free from those things, forgiven. It is an act of utter surrender, utter reliance. If you're not a believer today, this is what we want for you. We want you to stop relying on anything apart from the grace of God given to us in Jesus on the cross. We want for you to believe on Him for salvation. And as He raised to dead, raised from the dead to new life, you too can have eternal life. There is a universal depravity of man. All of us are born into a sin nature with one. All of us are spiritually dead at our starting point. And we must, we must rely not on self, but on God for our salvation. Now, I think everything that I just said there is true. I wouldn't have said it otherwise. But I don't think that the universal depravity of man is what Jesus had chiefly in mind here. Certainly, it wasn't the only thing he had in mind here. In other words, I don't think that Jesus is primarily trying to say, hey, all people are sinners, all people are spiritually dead in their sins and transgressions. That's where I would go. I asked you before, what, what, what might you say to explain to a person what it means to be born again? You'd probably start by saying you're not alive. You're spiritually dead now, like all mankind. You need to be brought into life. Probably something to that effect. But Jesus answers this a little bit different with Nicodemus. And I think the reason he does is because it's built on what he said in John chapter 1, verses 11 through 13. Last week I made this connection for you, but I didn't spend much time on it. John, the author of this gospel, went back in the very first chapter and introduced this language of being born again. He doesn't say born again, he just refers to it as, as birth. But it's very evident there, it's the same idea that now Jesus is explaining and unpacking in real time in John 3. I want to read for you what is said in John 1, in the intro and show you why I think what's going on here is a little bit different than just, than only talking about the universal depravity of man. John 1, 11 through 13. He, Jesus, came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. That's the context of what's being said right there. Months ago, when we were in this passage, I said here, and this is not a contentious argument between Christians, this is a pretty well-accepted uh, view on this. Jesus was Jewish, born into a Jewish, Hebrew, Israelite household, and, and, and uh, came to the Jews. That's what he's doing. His own people here, then, in this verse, are the Jews. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. And that's a big deal, of course, because you and I know that the Jews not receiving their Messiah was a special kind of dishonor to God. 
We want the Messiah. We want the Messiah, the Messiah, the very one, God, the very Messiah that you send. He sends Jesus. I want a different Messiah, not that one. There has to be someone else. There's something especially significant about the rejection of the Messiah from the Jews there. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So were these Israelites, these Jews, children of God in the sense that John is talking about here, if they did not receive Jesus? No, not all of them were. He gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Why is that so significant there? Because if you're familiar at all with the New Testament, especially in the Gospels, you'll be keenly familiar and aware that that the Jews, especially the the super Jews like the Pharisees, the well-educated ones that people looked up to, the high priest and his family and the other ruling councils of Jews and even the Sadducees and those who ran the temple. People look to those folks. They're Jewish. Their blood literally goes back to Abraham. In fact, they will even have the audacity on occasion to draw on that as a proof for why they are holy before God. In fact, John chapter 8 will be unpacked repeatedly. The people will say, we are sons of Abraham. Because they're right. They can trace their genetics right back to Abraham. But here right out of the gate, John tells us about Jesus. To all who did receive him, not, not, not everyone who's his own because they're Jewish, but all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, not because they've got the right DNA going back to Abraham, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, entering into the covenant from outside, but of God. It's a work of God that makes some um, Worthy of becoming children of God. You see, the Jews, and especially the Pharisees, relied on their heritage for their position before God. They did this repeatedly. They thought that any favor that they had from God was owing to their birthright. We are from Abraham. And on occasion, they're even so bold to say it. We we showed you a couple of the place in John chapter 8. But one of the themes in the Gospels, and especially in John, is the Jewish rejection of of their own Messiah. It's all over. He keeps coming to the Jews, they reject him. Come to the Jews, they reject him. Repeatedly. In Galatians, Paul is dealing with Gentile believers. And he's dealing with believers who have begun to regress back into a reliance on Jewish law for their standing before God. The problem with these, Jew, with these Gentiles is after they got saved, after what the work that had begun in them was from the Spirit, they began to rely on the flesh. And they began to to look back into the Old Testament, hear the words from the Jews and the Judaizers, and they were going, hey, let's do all those works. And it wasn't just a, hey, we want to honor God, and we found this in the Bible. No, 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 no. It was a, a reliance upon the works of the law. This is why Paul explicitly says that anyone who relies on works of the law is under a curse. That's the problem! He even says, if you're circumcised, stay circumcised. If you're not, stay not. Stop it. That's not what gets you favor before God, he says. He says this in Galatians 3, 3. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? You see, there's the Spirit-flesh language again. You started, how did they start? By the Spirit. And now you're going back to try to be perfected by the flesh? See, Jesus in John 3 here says the flesh begets flesh, spirit begets spirit. And these people who have already come about by the spirit are going, hey, let's go back and do that too. He's going, stop it, stop it. It's a damage to the gospel. In that letter, he even compares two famous sons in Israelite history. Who in history, without any symbolism, without any metaphor, can most clearly say, I'm a son of Abraham? There's two men, Ishmael and Isaac. There's only two men in all of history that can say, I'm a son of Abraham, and mean it without any kind of 
additional symbolism. It literally came from him. And it's why Paul uses these two in Galatians to try to explain there's wrong thinking. If you think you're going to go back to the flesh, go back to the natural ways, go back to the law and rely upon that. Both Isaac and Ishmael were full sons of Abraham. They equally shared the DNA of Abraham. They both had a separate mother, but one dad. Both were born after God gave His promise to Abraham that he would have a multitude of descendants. And both, Ishmael and Isaac, were circumcised. Both of them were old covenant members. Both. And yet Paul says that one is a son of promise and one is a son of slavery. Galatians 4.29 says this, Just as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh, that's Ishmael, persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, Isaac, so also it is now. There are sons of Abraham that are going to persecute you Christians. Jews will persecute you Christians. Because just because they can trace their lineage back to Abraham means nothing. They were not the same. Ishmael was born as a result of Abraham's lack of faith in God. That was the whole Hagar account. Oh, I'm going to be a multitude greater than the stars in the sky and the sand on the shore. I'll take care of that. He puts together a plan with his wife's approval, her prompting it seems. Finds another woman, concubine, sleeps with her. Brings about Ishmael. God goes, that, that, I didn't want you to do it your way. Later, he brings about the birth of Isaac. Ishmael was born as a result of Abraham's lack of faith in God, while Isaac was born purely as a supernaturally provided gift from God. So if someone were to ask Abraham later in life, hey, uh, I'm barren and I want to have kids. You were barren and you wanted to have kids. What'd you do? Abraham wouldn't go, here's how you fix it. He would say, the Lord provided miraculously. That's all he could say. The birth of one son was the result of the natural works of the flesh. There's the flesh kind of language we can remind it by. The other was the result of the miraculous work of the spirit. See, there's a flesh birth and a spirit birth. Both find them, same DNA, same heritage. The one's of promise and one is a slave. Jesus' statement here is actually simple. And that's why he says in the next line, do not marvel. <clears throat> do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Why not marvel? Because you should not be amazed by this. It should be entirely obvious to us. That just being human is not enough. Just being Jewish would not be enough. Not only is it self-evident that people, regardless of ethnicity, need God, but Pharisees, like Nicodemus, who were experts in the Old Testament, needed God and knew better than most that Israel's history was filled with covenant members who hated Him and were not true children of God. You know, I'm reading through the Old Testament with my kids again, kind of on cycle. Every time we go through, we walk back through the same sections again and Every time I get to the story of the kings and walk through that with the kiddos at night, I get the same questions coming up. So I've said this before, but literally I'll get to the end of the life of Saul, the end of the life of Solomon or Jeroboam, or, or the end of the life of Rehoboam or, or Ahab and Jezebel or, or Athaliah and, and Jehoshaphat. And as I get to the lives, one of my kids will inevitably say, is he in heaven? You know... If any one of those is in heaven, it's not owing to their Jewish heritage. We wouldn't go, well, Ahab's probably in heaven because he was a Jew. Wrong. He'd be no more qualified to enter the kingdom than the Canaanite kings that they warred against. Think about that. You read through the Old Testament and close it up. Being Jewish is not the answer. No guarantee of anything in eternity. And I know what I just said there. I'll say that again. Being Jewish is no guarantee of anything in eternity. You, you think that 
You think that if you had Jewish blood in you, you'd be more saved or less in some way? If you were to send a blood test away to one of those ancestry websites, you know, and they were to be returned back, you're thinking you're Irish and going, hey, apparently I'm, I'm Hebrew. Would that change anything about your eternity? You see, but that's what the Pharisees did. Don't marvel at that. Natural birth is not what gets a person into God's good graces. What you need, Nicodemus, and notice that Jesus applies this to him. Last week I said I think he's not yet saved. I think he's not yet born again. If he does become, maybe, but he's not yet. Here's one of the reasons I think why. Because in this text, Jesus switches the word to you. You must be born again. And it's plural. He's probably meaning y'all, y'all Pharisees, including you, Nicodemus. But he goes from the philosophical kind of like, one must be born again, to you must be born again. So I'm assuming he's not. Nicodemus, what you need, you need to be born again. You see, Nicodemus, because you're, you're a master of the law. You are a verifiable son of Abraham. And that's not enough. You, Nicodemus, are not born again. Your heritage, your knowledge of the Word, your trust in Old Testament Scriptures, maybe even a soft heart right now in this conversation, all the works you ever have done or will do, you're not born again. Now, Nicodemus, in John's retelling, doesn't have the chance to offer another question right here. But I'd have to imagine there's at least one in mind. Because Jesus is saying to him, you're not born again, you must be. What would be the next question in mind to any wise person? Well, how can I get it? Okay, I need to be born again. Again, Jesus, how? You have a cure. How do I get it? Whether or not he asked that question, Jesus seems to give an answer to it. He says, The wind blows where it wishes. And you hear it sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. Now, just like when Jesus spoke about born again, he mentions birth, Nicodemus got part. He got the natural part. There's no, okay, I got it. Yes, birth. I get it. Babies, mommies, wombs. Check. I know the natural stuff. Here's another natural one. Wind. Nicodemus, you know how wind works, right? It's that breeze you feel on your face. You, you, get, you know what that is. You don't know how it comes, where it comes from. You don't know where it's going. You, you hear it. But you can't predict it. You certainly can't control it. You know how that works, right, Nicodemus? And I can imagine Nicodemus, at least mentally, is, yeah, yeah, I get it. I I know a wind works, yes. And there's a little bit of a play on words, because the word for wind and spirit are the same word here. Awesome. And so here's Nicodemus. I'm I'm imagining, yeah, I, I get it. He's saying something that's true. No one should argue. But Jesus compares the Holy Spirit with the wind. Because he says, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. You know how wind works? Yes, it's like that. That's how it works. We are utterly powerless to determine the course of the wind. We can only observe the effects of it, and yet the wind greatly affects us. In fact, we are entirely dependent upon it. You and I need the wind to bring the rains and to push them away. When you're on a ship in the sea and the the sails go flat and you're sitting on a sea of glass, you can't make the wind go. What do you do? You wait. You're dependent on what you cannot control. The same is true or the person who is born of the Spirit. A man can no more cause his second birth than he causes his first. 
So his reliance must not be on anything in himself, but entirely upon the unpredictable and uncontrollable movement of the Holy Spirit. The Pharisees were not only experts in the Old Testament scriptures, they had become known for their strict observation of the externalities of the law. They were professional rule followers. None of that mattered. Do not rely, Nicodemus, on your blood. Do not rely on your hard, good works. You rely on the Spirit. Because apart from His moving, you will not be born again. And you will not enter the kingdom of God. An inevitable conclusion of this line of reasoning laid out by Jesus is that we are powerless to bring about our own regeneration. You have to work pretty hard to try to make this text say something else. Jesus' answer here is in response to Nicodemus' assumption that it would be po- impossible for a man to crawl back into the womb, right? And is he right? Yeah, he's right. That's not possible for a man to get back in the womb and be born again. He's right. And so he kind of scoffs. He kind of laughs a bit. And, w- and whether it's mean-spirited kind of, you know, or if it's just a, hey, I don't understand. Either way, it's built on the assumption that it's not possible for a man to do that. But here's the irony. As Jesus goes on to explain, the reality is actually far more impossible. Your predicament is worse than you think, Nicodemus. The new birth is actually a greater miracle than what Nicodemus suggests. It would be more impossible for a man to climb back into a womb and be born again than for him to be spir- to spiritually born himself. You get it? This is one of those crazy moments where Jesus is telling this impossible something to someone. And Nicodemus is like, whoa, whoa, you're saying I have to bench press a bulldozer? No, you have to bench press the world. There are occasions where Jesus says really hard stuff and people turn to him. I'm thinking of one in my mind very specifically where he's speaking to the disciples about a rich man entering into the kingdom of heaven. Easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. They go, how is it even possible for a man to be saved? He says, what is impossible with man is possible with God. It is a supernatural work of God to be born again. Why the illustration of birth? That's why. Because it's not something you do. It's something that is done to you. This is why the language is passive. The language here um, is that that which is born of flesh is flesh. And in the end of verse 8, it says, so it is with everyone who who is born of the Spirit. That's, That's important. It's passive language. It's not, so it is with those who born themselves in the Spirit. No, 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 no. It's those who receive this something. You no more cause yourself to be born the first time than you cause yourself to be born the second time. So what you need is utterly unattainable by you. One of the commentaries that I read on this from J.C. Ryle, he just said it simply, we might as well expect a dead man to give himself life. As expect the natural man to make himself spiritual. It's like the light commanding God to bring itself into existence. Oh, good idea, light. Okay, okay. Let there be light. No, 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 no. It's a kind of something that's hard to fit in your own mind, isn't it? Now, here's the question for us today as believers. I said to you before, it's important to know this stuff and to reflect upon it and think about it. Why? Not just so you can tighten up your theology. That'd be wonderful. I think you should. But practically speaking, you need to know this. You need to understand the error of thinking that I think Nicodemus may have had. Because it's in you. You need to know and be warned that there is an impulse inside of you to try to work to God. There is. There's a little Pharisee in all of us. And it's why when we live lives, we're trying to do what's right, repenting of sin, we're spending time in the Word, 
we're, we're acknowledging issues and we're seeking wisdom, we're trying to do the right thing, and then something bad happens, we go, God, why? Well, it's why it's in us, even if you never get to that fish-shaking moment. Because we know, we, we have that inside of us that it it's, comes up, why should I have to endure this? What have I done to deserve this? Have I, have I not, oh God, tried to be a good man? It's a part of your flesh. But our utter dependence upon the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives must be a daily exercise of faith. Daily. It's not a baton race. A relay where the Holy Spirit does the first three laps and then hands the baton. Oh, I got it. I got it from here. That's what, he's, that's what Paul says is so foolish of the Galatians. Having begun by the Spirit, you're now going to continue that race and be perfected by the flesh? Are you out of your mind? Have you not learned anything? The Bible tells us if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You see, you and I are still in the flesh. And as long as we're in the flesh, there will be a battle because the new you does not fit very well into the old you. You know, I love hiking. Uh, I, I, occasionally, I wear out a pair of boots and have to get a new pair. And you go into the REI and you put on the boots and the, the, the person comes over and stands you in front of that fake rock that you stand on and kind of test it out like that helps somehow. But you're feeling the boot and you strap it on, you tighten it and they, there's a whole bunch of little exercises they'll say to make sure it fits and find the right one for you. By the time you walk out of the store, you're like, these, these feel pretty good. Six miles later, your feet are covered with blisters. And this actually happens in the life of people all the time. Believers, they come to saving faith in Christ. It's like getting the new boots on. They're like, this is awesome. This is, I'm supposed to walk in this now. I'm supposed to walk in a new life as a new creation. And six miles down the road, oh, this is really painful. Sometimes people get so discouraged, they sit down and they stop walking. Because all of a sudden they realize the pain and the burden of it. Because the, 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 the nice fit in the shop is now being put to the test. Your new you and your old you don't fit very well together. Like an old wool sweater on bare skin. You know the feeling. It's not, it's, it ugh, doesn't work together. It's a war and it's a battle all the time. And you're going to have to wage that battle every day. You have to fight back against your own sin and pride. You're going to have to constantly be on the lookout for new things that your sinful flesh came up with you weren't even ready for. I don't even know I would be tempted by that. And oftentimes it's the same old, same old, same old things you're going to have to battle. And how are you going to do it, Christian? How are you going to do it? you don't understand how it is you got saved, you'll be more likely to fall for the temptation that though being saved by the Spirit, you can be perfected by the flesh. It's awful to watch a believer do that. To have felt the wind and the sails, pick them up off of a dead sea, and as they get up speed, oh, that's how it works. I got this now. And pull down the sails and stick the oar in. <sighs> you go, stop. What are you doing? Having begun with the Spirit, you aren't perfected by the flesh. Sure, put the oar in. So you leave the sails up and you pray for the wind. You and I have to be careful here. We can fall for this. We must not be like the foolish Galatians. We must not think like the Nicodemuses, the Pharisees of the world may have thought. I'm doing pretty good. And even after we're saved, we must make sure that all of our reliance is on the Spirit of God and work within us. You know, don't you, that as a believer, you must be in God's Word all the time. You know you must be in constant prayer and in fellowship, and in community, and gather with other believers in worship. You need to be in accountability. You need to confess sin, and you need to be 
be sanctified. But all of these things must be done in absolute dependence on the Holy Spirit. If you do those things without depending on Him, they will become works of the law for you. In fact, they may not even produce spiritual benefit, but harm. You know, one example I have of this in my life, I've told you many times, there was a really important season. I returned back from a hard deployment in the Marines in Iraq, and I returned back just filled with darkness and anger and lust of the heart and all shameful thoughts. There was a point at which I remember falling asleep one night, and as I went to bed, I loved my sin and hated God, and I woke up just loving God and hating my sin. And I went to the Word. I always had a Bible, and I, I flipped through, and I did one of those kind of like, uh, you know, Russian roulette kind of <laughs> Bible study, where, where am I going? wherever it lands. And uh, it just happened, I landed on Psalm 34, 18. And I've shared this before. I've shared this verse with you all before because it's been such a treasure. Because I was at a point where I just was broken hearted. All the pain I'd put myself and others through in my folly running from the Lord. I just had a toll. I left a wake of wounded people and pain and sin behind me and I'd gotten myself into such an awful mire and a mess. I was just genuinely just broken hearted. I just couldn't, couldn't breathe. In Psalm 34, 18, that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And he saves those who are crushed in spirit. And I get emotional about it because I still remember how that felt when I read it. But you know, as I've reflected on that moment back in my life over and over, I wouldn't tell somebody, hey, here's how you solve the problem. If you get to a dark place and you have a spark where you realize something needs to change, this is what you do. This is what you do. You go like this, and you go like this, and you read. That's, that's what you do. You know, there are more than 31,000 verses in the Bible. And I landed there. What do you think? I, didn't, I can't conclude today that it was because I did it just right, because I checked the box, because I did the thing. I believe wholeheartedly the Spirit of God led me to that verse and made it meaningful. And He used His Word to change me, just like He used His prayer to change you. And he uses accountability to work on you and confession to work on you. And he uses worship to equip you. And he uses all the things that he's given to a believer by his spirit. He does that mighty work. So brother, sister, pray. Read the word. And do all those things in full reliance on the spirit of God. God, please equip me. Help me see something true today. Help me not just because I'm getting to the 20 minutes on my prayer time. Huh? 19 minutes, okay, one more. What else is there? No, not just that. Lord, help me rely upon your spirit in all of it. And if you're sitting there right now and you're still wondering, you're thinking, like, how, does that, how does that work? How does that look? I am full well aware, this is not lost on me, that what I'm preaching right now, I'll also say it straight like this, requires the spirit of God to clarify in your heart what I'm meaning. <laughs> Because it just, on the outside, just looks like acts and works. Brothers and sisters, you and I need God's Spirit to move. And when He does, He affects great change. And that's what I pray for you. Let's do it now. Lord, this morning, I just appeal to your Spirit. No sermon could be of any effect unless you did something in the heart and the mind of people. And so I pray that you would do that. We just rely on you humbly, fully. Every prayer that we pray that has had any effect has been because you have equipped us to pray the prayer and have carried it along by the power of the Spirit. Father, every word we've ever read in the Bible would have been utterly useless to us, maybe a basis for further judgment for us if your Spirit hadn't opened our eyes to see. 
Father, every good work that you command us to do, that we've ever done, may have even aided us in pride, in thinking that we were deserving of some good mercy or grace from you, deserving of something given from you, a wage earned. But Lord, by your Spirit, you convict us. You remind us of our unworthiness and the worthiness of Christ. So, I ask that you do it again. I ask that by your Spirit you make my brothers and sisters and myself a praying people, a word-reading people, a confessing people, a good work-doing people, but all by your Spirit. We would kneel before you in humility someday and say, even it was our good works carried out by you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.